Let's take a look at the F-15 pilot who fought in Desert Storm and wrote a book about it. Hi everyone, today we will be listening to parts of an interview I did for my podcast with retired USAF Lieutenant Colonel Rick Tolini, call sign Cluso. Rick flew the F-15, fought in Desert Storm, shot down a MiG, and ended up being a squadron commander in his incredible career. He wrote an excellent book entitled Call Sign Cluso. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can check it out. And now, without further ado, here is part of the interview. I'd like to ask you about the opening night sorties that you flew, or I think it was your first day sortie when you had an encounter with what ended up being four MiGs. Can you talk about that? I was the mission commander for the first night's mission. It was the O300 uh, going into Iraq, the very opening of Desert Storm. And I led an eight ship of F-15s that were part of the very first fighter sweep. And I, this is just a quick synopsis of that. And we shot down uh, three Iraqi aircraft. My number three man, J.B. Kelk, had the first uh, the first shoot down of the war against the Iraqi MiG-29. We had a series of several other missions after that on a very high tempo again. And then on January 19th, J.B. Had, was his turn to lead a mission. So I was his number three. And we had a very, this was one of those very large hundred airplane missions going to Baghdad. Wow. And it got canceled uh, in the morning because of weather in the target area. And I think there were some other things going on because the Iraqis had just shot scuds at Israel. So they canceled all our mission. And then I got a call from a friend of mine from Kadena. His name was uh, Spad McSpadden, Richard McSpadden. And he said, we need some eagles to go up and fly a cap for some scud hunters in Western Iraq because they wanted to find the scuds that were shooting at Israel. And uh, it was like, no, nah, we're, we're like totally tasked because <laughs> I, I, we're, you know, we're basically into day three of the war and I knew everything and I'd done all the scheduling. So I knew everything was tasked, but I, and I thought about it, you know, we just landed early. Uh, let me ask our maintenance if they can turn the jets around and get us in the air. And the maintenance guy said, yeah. So about 30 minutes later, I called SPAD back. And so, yeah, we can do it. And so literally we just, you know, kick the tires, light the fires is the same. And we're up in the air again. I'm leading the four ship. And we're just waiting around and a, a Navy strike package from the Red Sea uh, Navy forces was going in through our area to hit some targets near Baghdad and then coming out. And we just kind of wanted to move out of the way for several reasons, <laughs> safety being the big one. And then on the process of them, of them leaving uh, their target, some MiGs were scrambled and appeared to be chasing them down. And I, I was able to confirm uh, later through another source that, yes, they were actually chasing them down. So our AWACS in our sector, our Western sector, uh, committed us against those uh, Iraqi aircraft. And initially it was two MiG-29s chasing them down. So we we just lit the afterburners and put them in a cutoff position, kind of intercept uh, to get there quickly and got there just in time to where they they came off the Navy package and then headed northeast. And it looked a lot like a tactic possibly that we had seen been briefed on or Intel had briefed us on that the Iraqis used against the um, Iranians during their long war. Because right after the MiGs turned away, two more MiGs popped up north of them, about 30 miles north of them. And we turned, I turned my flight to check those guys out and engage them. And they turned out to be MiG-25s down at very low altitude, going very, very fast. And so that was the four ship we faced at the time. And we still had to respect the other two MiG-29s because if they turned around, uh, then, then it would be, uh, you know, more aircraft coming to the merge. But at that time, they didn't. And so I turned the flight in north into the MiG-25s. And then the Iraqi Foxbat pilots do a very good job defending against our radar capabilities and our potential to shoot them at beyond visual range, BVR, with our AIM-7s. And that was a big surprise. And But we were ready for that because we'd been trained against those kind of defensive tactics. So... So they, when they turned back in, uh, me and my wingman, Cherry Pitts, Larry Cherry Pitts, uh, we got our radars in position. We found them as they came back into the fight, but they were just way too close now. And we had a big 
we were very high, they were very low, very fast. And we ended up at a merge, which is a visual fight, which we did not expect to happen. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, that's one of those things you're talking about. It's like, it wasn't the plan. Uh, we were going to shoot them at long range and then get out of the fight. But now it was uh, me and my wingman initially 2v2, but one of the Fox bats left the fight at very high speed to the south. We didn't have a shot. I didn't have a shot capability. That was the guy I was targeting. And so it became a classic, what we call ACM, air combat maneuvering fight, where it was me and Cherry, me and my wingman, two versus one against the one Fox bat that turned at the merge. And that was probably to his unfortunate demise because he had two F-15s uh, he had to fight against. And he did the best he could. Uh, he was using chaff, radar countermeasures, flares for IR missile countermeasures. And he survived several very close range shots from Cherry. Uh, Cherry's third or fourth shot finally got to him. He actually ejected out of his Fox bat. I didn't see that, but Cherry did. And then my, my AIM-9, uh, heat seeker followed that up shortly after. And as we were trying to leave the fight, the other Fox bat came in and Cherry saw him. I picked him up in an auto uh, acquisition mode in my radar. And I was able to just quickly convert very close to his six o'clock. But it's the uh, everybody out of burners call that is made that I'm trying to identify is this a Fox bat or an F 15 or a Navy Tomcat? since those guys were around earlier. Uh, but I finally figured out by visual recognition more than anything that it was a Fox bat. And, and from that point on, I, I continued the engagement until one of my aim sevens finally blows them up. And so that was probably, uh, yeah, that was an intense fight uh, from many perspectives. A uh, lot of temporal distortion. <laughs> you asked, was it surreal? And I said, yeah, it was surreal. But the unique thing was, was how automatic everything was. And that tempo part where you're just doing things based off your training and not have to actually think about them. And that was the benefit of the, how good our training was probably more than what the Iraqi Foxbat pilots had been able, levels of training they'd been able to achieve, even though they were very experienced combat pilots and they executed their tactics very well. Uh, they just, when they got to the visual mirrorage, they were, they were in the wrong airplane. So that's basically the way that progressed. And, and that's the way that ended. And that from my book, that's like chapter eight in my book. And that's, that's kind of the nexus of the story. Uh, obviously, uh, both pre-career, post-career, as I say in the book, for me, it was one data point, but it did validate our training. It did validate the concept of mutual support of the flight lead and the wingman uh, helping each other. In our case, that, that made the difference, and that's why we were successful. When it comes to air-to-air -air combat, in the book, you mentioned how tempo is everything and how that manifests or translates into the ODA loop. That's O-O-D-A. Uh, can you elaborate on that? I could probably give you like a two-hour lecture on it if you'd <laughs> like. Because <laughs> some of my students here get that lecture. That was something I more have I came to a re realization of later in my career. And even now, as I'm instructing in the simulator, because I started recognizing that the Air Force doesn't train to tempo sometimes. And we did it naturally through the process of our, you know, large force employment, of our high level of training and, and things like that, uh, to where, let me, let me coin another term for you. And this is not mine. I Googled it. I kind of thought about it. And I go, let me Google this and see if it exists. And it does. It was called intuitive expertise. Uh, that's what you want to reach as a fighter pilot or as any professional mm -hmm. is a level of intuitive expertise where you can make uh, decisions intuitively quickly. And, and that is part of that whole OODA loop cycle. And the example I give in using that is we do a, a very basic level of training, which is called BFM. It's, it's basic fighter maneuvers. And for your audience that doesn't know what that is, that's one versus one maneuvering in a visual environment, usually within a mile of each other, mile and a half of each other, uh, where you're fighting either with an offensive advantage or defensive disadvantage against one other aircraft. 
And the people, and I figured this out after I became an instructor and I had to get better at it, um, that the people who can stay one step ahead of the adversary, even in a defensive posture with the guy behind you, actually gains a quick advantage in the fight and actually forces the adversary to constantly be reacting to him. And in the process of that reaction, you have already analyzed it while it's occurring and selected your next move before he's even finished his last move. And so if that makes sense is that you, you get one or two steps ahead on the OODA loop. Uh, so that's the very basic aspect of it in a one versus one environment. In a larger, uh, and this is not a concept that is unknown, obviously, but in a larger wartime combat concept, it's the same thing is that you press the initiative against the adversary and don't let him recover from that. In other words, you are constantly updating and selecting the next move, the next tactic, the next execution, and the adversary is constantly on their heels. And that's the that's really the art of war, mm-hmm. going back all the way through centuries of, like, if you read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, which I read as a young fighter pilot, it's the constant in, in anything in life, but especially in lethal events like combat uh, that you have to use tempo as part of your tactics. Yeah. War is, from what I can gather, is about, it's not about a fair fight. It's about pressing and continuing to press your advantage, right? Yeah. And I think General Patton coined this phrase, and obviously he was well known for his being an operational tactician, but he said, a good plan executed now is better than a perfect plan executed too late. Yeah. And then that's that's the idea behind the OODA loop and tempo in combat. So the intuitive expertise was the term, correct? Yeah. So that to me sounds like it relates to the 10,000 hour rule where it takes, you know, some time. And and what I've heard is from that as well is or related to that is things start to, you know, quote unquote slow down, right? Mm-hmm. And then you kind of can almost step outside of what's happening and, and really analyze everything that's going on, not just what you're doing. That's a perfect description of it, I think. Thank you. So yeah, and that's true of almost any skill that that's learned in life, right? It's that thing. Yeah, really is. And and the you know, just the average person should can probably recognize it in their own life experience of when that when they reach that point. Absolutely. I have a mantra that I always use is always add value, right? In any situation, as much as you can walk away, having added some value. Yeah. And that's a very important, and I kind of present that at the end of my book in the last chapter is when you make every decision based off of a value orientation. And especially when that value and orientation is, is towards the human being, <laughs> right. the individual involved, uh, you're generally always going to make the right decision. At the end of my career, uh, when I became a squadron commander, I kind of realized if I made a decision based off of what I thought was best for the Air Force or best for the mission, lots of times it was the wrong decision. And I'd forgotten the lessons that I'd been taught somewhere along the way early on. And I came to that re-realization, take care of the people and the people will take care of the mission. But you lose sight of that so easily. Yeah. <laughs> and and especially when you're in a position of responsibility, you think you have to make micromanage, like you said. And so uh, I came to that realization. And, and from that point on, every time I made a decision and I put the person first to create value for that person in their career or just their personal life, always, always 100% worked out much better, not just for that person, but for the Air Force. That was probably even more than my combat experience. The most rewarding aspect of my career was at the very end uh, of the sum of the struggles I had to go through at the end. But the value I could create in that process, by far the most rewarding aspect of my career. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed Rick's stories, you definitely should check out his book, which is available as either a hardcover or in digital format. Link in the description below. Rick goes into much more detail and has some great advice on how to add value in life. I'll also leave a link to the podcast episode where you can listen to our full interview. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more content like this, click on the subscribe button and then on the bell for notifications. 
and thank you to my patrons who directly help support this channel. If you'd like to become a TOG Insider, I'll leave a link in the description below. Stay safe, and see you next time.